thanks for inviting me. Uh, to say that for me, the first reaction when I was invited to speak about something which is called the United States of Europe and particularly the possibilities of resistance in relation to art or the cultural sector, my first reaction was I'm totally disillusioned with resistance these days. And obviously even more with resistance to art, cultural practice. This of course has to do a little bit with where I'm coming from, uh, which I'm going to try to share some information with you about. I have to say that for me, at the moment, the very phrase United States of Europe has got nothing that is emancipatory or utopian or progressive. It's something very, very scary in my experience. It is really something which is being advocated as a kind of dominant narrative, but which also has very identifiable policies behind it. And they have identifiable results. And the results are barbaric for the society I live in and my experience. For example, I wonder how we can look at a phrase such as United States of Europe when maybe 10 days ago, Mr. Hollande, the president of France, was in Greece saying that he was there to support French businesses. And a little bit before then, Mr. Schäuble from Germany was also there to support German businesses. What does this mean? It means that according to the program uh, that we have been subjected to, there is a lot of stuff to get privatized in Greece. And, of course, French businesses are interested in buying it up. German businesses are interested in buying it up. Now, this is to say that in one sense, yes, there is a kind of internationalism or Europeanism going on. In terms of real policy, though, it is being played out on long, very definable, very, very definite national lines. To put it a little bit better, there is globalization capital in the sense that it doesn't really matter that it is a French company. There's nothing national or nationalistic about the company itself. It's just a company. But the political power, the projection of power that is being used in order to make that company profit uh, is very much a national issue. In this case, French or German, they too being the basic architects of this European project. So in my experience, it's not really about the United States of Europe in any positive sense. Um, this is by way of introduction to bring it to maybe the main point in what I'm going to talk about, which is that the issue we face, the way we should, I think, describe it is not a financial issue. It's not an issue of economies, it's not an issue of economic models, it is a political issue. And fundamentally it's an issue of democracy. Um, it's an issue of the solution of democracy, an issue of being subjected to things that even five years ago would have been absolutely unthinkable. I grew up in what could be described as the most stable political phase of, of Greece after 1974, when the military junta collapsed. And we have had these decades of uh, democratic governance and uh, financial development, <coughs> relative prosperity. Um, to put this in a lot more concrete terms, I grew up without fearing the police. I wasn't afraid when I was walking on the street. Now I'm afraid. Um, I'm going to take us through a few things. Um, first of all, by way of disclaimer, I'm not proposing a theory here. I'm not a theorist. I've been a curator, I've been an arts manager, I've been a fundraiser. Basically, I'm a journalist, which means I'm a journalist who knows a little bit about art, 
which shouldn't come, to, uh, come as a surprise because journalists, journalists know a little about everything. Um, what I'm going to try to do is give you a bit of personal experience, show you some material, and maybe contribute a few thoughts to how this conference is going to go from now on. I'd like to start with a film. It's very short, it's just five minutes, and then we <coughs> from there. Oops.
This was never justified, it was never supported, but it was never retracted either. It was the first sign we had. The second sign was the same minister going on TV and saying that one of the greatest dangers faced by the Greek family today is HIV positive immigrant prostitutes. This was on national television. And that the Greek family should take great care not to bring disease into its midst. A few days later, the police make a arbitrary sweep in the center of Athens and they arrest about 40 um, prostitutes from the street. They force test them for HIV. And the ones found positive have their images and personal information published on the internet, on the police website. Everything. Country of origin, uh, father's name, mother's name, absolutely everything. Um, there's no serious reaction from the media. Only a few independent media start uh, screaming, but mainstream media just go about endlessly reproducing these pictures, saying things like, this is the face of death. Now, these were women that were not convicted of anything. They were arrested on charges of prostitution, but they were not convicted. Uh, most of them were drug users. What has happened since then? I mean, it's an interesting theory, if one can support it. Yes, okay, immigrant women forced into prostitution, have HIV, whatever. What happened after that initial 40? Well, nothing happened. It just quietly went away. And these people are, of course, gradually being released, one a week, so that much of us is kicked up. Because obviously, most of them were just drug users found in an area where prostitution also uh, is common. Nobody was really interested in prosecuting these people, but the minister got re-elected. This was a few weeks before the election. He did get re-elected. A socialist minister, mind you, coming from the socialist center party, huh? not a right-wing extremist or whatever. Moving on, different aspects of what I'm going to talk about. This is Kalkiliki in northern Greece, a uh, beautiful place, one of the most beautiful places in the country, a uh, huge forest, quite a lot of protected species, etc., but the environment's not in my point here. This is a new development, this is gold mining. Uh, the area is called Skouriges. Now, Greece, at the moment, as we all know, is in dire need of money. And the story goes a little bit like this. At one moment, a company called TVX Greece, TVX Gold, the subsidiary of a Canadian gold mining company, goes out of business because the Supreme Court of Greece says it has polluted the environment to the hellish extent, so it declares back bankruptcy and can't pay the fines. The Greek state steps in and says, okay, I'll get the mines off you for 11 million euro, and I'll write off your fines for polluting. Then it sells the mines for exactly the same amount without making any money at all as a state to a new company that's been set up a couple of days before with a huge capital of 60,000 euros. This is to buy gold mines. But, the transaction goes through, gets blessed by the Greek court of first instance. Now this company, Hellas Gold, is just a front really, it's just two people. If you look into it a little bit better, who are these two people? They are members of the board of two the, the biggest construction companies in Greece, called Actor and Elactor, I won't bother you with names very much, they're hard to pronounce. Anyway, two big companies. They belong to this guy, Yorgos Bobolas. He also owns a great share of Greek media. 
perhaps the most popular TV station, shares in it at least, uh, a couple of newspapers, magazines, radios, etc. After a few years, this company gets a new lease on a huge bit of land, about 400,000 uh, square meters, to do a new gold mine, open pit gold mining, and the local residents again protest. It goes to the Supreme Court again, the one that previously had condemned that very same practice in the area, only now it's a financial crisis and Greece needs money. So the opinion of the Supreme Court is that even if there is environmental damage, Greece needs the money, so it gives the green light. The problem with this is that even if we accept that logic, it's not a good deal. According to the Greek mining code, sorry I'm getting a bit technical here, but this is necessary to understand. According to the Greek mining code, Greece gets exactly zero on rights of its own gold. Furthermore, it has sold the mines for 11 million euros. So, hasn't made any money. It paid 11 million to buy it. So. What's more, the company is being channeled into what is called Article 107 of the Greek Constitution. That is a really strange law. It provides for the protection of foreign capital. Now, one would wonder, in a democracy where all property is protected equally, why would foreign capital need extra protection? And there's no shortage of legal scholars that have commented on exactly this. Uh, it's a law of 1953 that is still in effect. Now, what it does is it locks uh, taxation for a company very, very low, and it protects the status of the investment for at least 10 years. This, without going through Parliament, it's done by presidential decree. This all means that this investment can't be touched, even if the government changes, even if the Supreme Court is full of communists who will have you in five years. They can't change it. They have to change the constitution. They have to make a new constitution. And of course, now we know that Hellas Gold, this front company that was founded on 60,000 euros, is not Hellas Gold because in this conglomerate, as it turned out to be, this Greek guy, Greek construction magnate, who provided obviously the political connections and the way that this could all operate, now only holds 5%. 95% is Eldorado Gold, a huge Canadian company, again, uh, that operates gold mines all over the world, Turkey, Romania, Africa. Well, moving on. This is just a few weeks ago. The police released another set of pictures. These pictures. These were arrestees after a, a bank robbery. Um, and uh, when some of us pointed out that they were obviously photoshopped, like you can see, there's obviously a hand grabbing that by the throat. It's been sort of crudely painted out. When we pointed that out, the police released an next set of pictures which looked like this. I just have one of the guys. The minister was asked, okay, why did you photoshop the images? And he, very deadpan tone of voice, replied, well, they had to be recognized. So, you beat the crap out of them, then you photoshop them, so that people can recognize them. That's a very novel idea. This isn't coming, again, as an isolated incident. A few months ago, 
Another <coughs> set of RSDs were brutally tortured. Uh, even taser guns were used. The practice is you handcuff them on a chair and beat them up all night until the lawyers get there. Um, and this again is not coming as a surprise because uh, humanitarian organizations have got literally hundreds of reports for torture by the Greek police. And again, it's not just reports. Greece has been condemned by the European Court of Human Rights 12 times in the last 10 years because of torture by the police. So we know the police torture people. That's basically my point. Now we, in this magazine I edit, unfollow, we thought that this concept of torturing people and photoshopping them in order for them to be recognizable could perhaps work in reverse. So in our issue that got published a few days ago, our 15th issue, we did this. This is the Prime Minister of Greece and it reads underneath Photoshop Prime Minister, politics must be recognizable. <laughs> At the moment, I've escaped a bit of a storm coming here to talk because the members of Parliament of the ruling party have gone on television quite a few times already asking for the authorities to step in. I don't know if they're going to do it or not. So it's obviously a bit of a a little bit of a risk. <clears throat> Why am I telling you this? It's not just to give you a bit of information about what's happening in Greece. And believe me, it is happening. It is absolutely brutal. It's also that perhaps one of the ways we could start, um, I don't know, address the issue here is not so much whether artists should leave their practice to go demonstrate or that, but just what kind of impact are we after? I mean, when you're faced with this, what are you saying? And what is what you're saying doing? I think that should be the question. And there's no easy answer to that. There's no sort of, oh, if more people saw it, or if, you know, I went to demonstrate and started shouting. I mean, I'm talking, we've shouted a lot, we've been shouting, you know, getting beat up and tear gassed for three years now. Nothing changed. It's not that, you know, you didn't manage to change something through making exhibitions, and if you demonstrate, you change something. We didn't change anything. I'm sorry if I'm impressive. So let me go into part a little bit. Those of you that uh, we had a, a nice conference maybe a year and a half ago, again here in Cork, uh, maybe you've heard a couple of these stories before those of you that were there, but they're kind of important to what I want to say, so excuse the repetition, those of you who weren't there will find it more interesting. This is Mr. Daskalopoulos. Mr. Daskalopoulos is a collector, Greek collector, famous collector, uh, also president of the Greek Industrialists Association. Um, a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago, I went to see an exhibition of his. I was invited because I've also been uh, the another director, he happens to be another co-director, so Mr. Daskalopoulos was one of our sponsors in the past. I was invited to, to go to Bilbao uh, to an exhibition of his collection uh, there, which was very interesting. And uh, on the second day there was an artist's panel, and one of the artists there speaking was a very well-known Thomas Hirschhorn, who among other things in talking about his work was uh, talking about the Guggenheim Dubai boycott that was going on at the time. I don't know if you remember, there was a protest uh, with many signatures gathered from artists and practitioners and whatever around the world, uh, they protested uh, working conditions in Dubai. And Thomas Hirschborn just happened to mention 
that he signed this petition and was obviously very interested in this. Uh, what's also interesting is to say that he was talking about this in relation to the work he was presenting at the exhibition called Caveman Man, a very famous installation, uh, which has the motto repeated all through this cave that he builds, in the fashion we all know, and the motto was one man equals one man. And this is a comment on hierarchical structure of society, etc. Now, after he finished, Mr. Vescalopoulos, the collector, stood up and said that, of course, there is a, an issue with working conditions in Dubai, but he disagrees with the point of it, uh, because he, as a member of the board of the International Guggenheim Foundation, believes that they are the agents of change in Dubai. They are not the guilty ones. And I remember him using the phrase that impressed me very much at the time, we are all on the same side. As far as I'm concerned, the obvious question in that moment was not asked. And the obvious question, the crucial question is, who is we who are on the same side? Who, who are we? What I'm trying to say is that this is a way of reflecting about how art and cultural practice has been structured and organized before the crisis. This is perhaps an opportunity to do that, and I think, I think we're not doing it adequately. I can speak again from my point of view, from my part of the world, but as I mentioned in the beginning, I grew up in a country that had increasing levels of prosperity and democracy, and there was an ideology that was being built there, and I mean ideology in the primary sense of mystification of actual social relations, of actual social conflict, a story that makes consensus seem real. And this was exactly that story. We are all on the same side. We have no fundamental problems anymore. There are no structural conflicts. There are no social groups whose interests are fundamentally opposed. No, we have technical problems. We have issues of not quite knowing how to do things very well yet, but we will if we improve know-how, if we work a bit harder, if we progress a bit more. Things are going to get better. Haven't they gotten better? That was the argument. I believe that this was the ideology that was fundamentally necessary to have the kind of art structures that we have had up to now. This ideology is the prerequisite for all this. Take the analysis that I've worked for. I think they've proven some of the more general, generalized, self-replicating modes of present, presenting art. At one point, there were about 100 worldwide, which means there was an opening every couple of weeks, if my math is correct. Um, let me show you this. First half is Vienna, 2007, one of our hits. The mural on the wall is by an artist called Stenius Freitakis, who's kind of cross between graffiti and time iconography, uh, stories of uh, riot police, you see that you can kind of get the ideas. In the middle, where you can't really see it, it was one of our gems. This is a little sketch by Pablo Picasso. It uh, shows a man on the Acropolis holding a Greek flag. It uh, has a little story. Um, during the Nazi occupation of Athens, there was uh, this couple of guys that uh, went up to the Acropolis and took down the Nazi flag and threw it uh, under the rock. Um, these were, of course, considered heroes after the, the occupation. But because after the occupation there was a very strict right-wing state uh, in Greece, they were persecuted. And one of them, called Manolis Glezos, was accused of espionage. Uh, what he was was a communist, uh, not a spy, but he was going to be put on 
trial, and at the time, Pablo Picasso made this little drawing to support the uh, expenses of his defense. It was uh, published in L'Humanité and also as a postcard which was to be sold. Uh, we found the original sketch and uh, exhibited it. Which to me still sounds like a nice curating moment. Um, the problem is that having been not only a curator but also a manager of this and a fundraiser for it, uh, I have to tell you, I've never really used this argument in trying to raise money for the Athens Biennale, ever. What I mostly talked about was that Biennales are very good in creating a contemporary com competitive identity for cities. They contribute to urban development and they also create a kind of secondary economy in terms of services. To put it bluntly, if people travel to see the Athens Biennale, then they will take taxis, they will buy sandwiches, they will stay in hotels, etc, etc. This is the rhetoric that goes on behind this. And I believe that the majority of everybody uh, that is involved in arts management and has helped to manage a space, a museum, a show, whatever, knows this very well. Now, there's a so additional issue with this. When at one point we abandoned this sort of maxim of social democracy that art and culture is a public good, it should be necessary, and it is necessary, and it should be funded and supported through collective processes. And we started building this rhetoric for which we are absolutely personally guilty in the arts business that somehow the public and the private sector should work together and help each other, whatever, which we did very well. When the crisis comes and all these marketing budgets go away, it's very hard to maintain that you are necessary. Because what you've been doing up to now was attracting revenue by posting things on Twitter such as what is your favorite artwork of the week, win a salad and whatever in our cafe, etc. So now, how do you go back and say, well, you know, I'm part of the identity of this place. This is how you build a sense of self. No, you can't. It's very difficult. So, another issue that we could perhaps wonder on was, now, how does this relate not to a retelling of conflict, not to a enclosed narrative that you experience in that space, made possible by a totally contradictory rhetoric. But how does it relate to actual conflict? The fact that we're not on the same side. A relevant example. The guy who 
we talked about when we mentioned gold mining at the beginning. Two companies. So, this is a prime example that all this free market rhetoric is really just that, rhetoric. There's nothing free about the market where two companies share the whole thing between them. I remember being with a friend, a French art theorist, smoking outside a bar at one point, and you know, I told him that I'm having real conscience problems with this free market thing, and he said, you know, I'm totally for the free market, it's capitalism the problem with. So I think he's essentially right. Capitalism has got very little to do with the free market. It's not about the free market, it's a monopolies. And this is another aspect of what is happening in Greece at the moment. The whole thing is being carved up. It's divided between 10 players. There's no more than that. And it also doesn't have to do with a smaller state or things like that. It has to do with a very powerful state because it would have been possible to divide all this wealth up without a very powerful state that makes the laws. The state is small in terms of welfare. It's small in terms of freedom. It's not a weak state. It's an all-powerful state. Now, what does this have to do with art? But that's where we get our money from. So, that should create a problem, no? I mean, doesn't it? Well, try to wrap it up a little bit. La rivoluzione siamo noi. The revolution is us. A work from the third half of 2011. I'm not as certain as a commenter earlier that what we should do is dump the whole thing and go protest outside some ministry. I don't, in fact, I don't think we should do that. But I do think that simply saying that art has never been able to be so sort of practically useful structurally uh, to inflict change, as in changing a law or whatever, uh, what we can do is open up spaces for discourse or whatever, is at the same time a very, very comfortable position to be in. It's exactly that position which allows you to, you know, say, yeah, but, you know, if I don't participate in this exhibition, then I can't make my work uh, have my work seen, etc., etc. Uh, we have to somehow challenge that position. Don't, don't know exactly how, but I've got a few suggestions. I don't remember the name now, which is a mistake. I'm very sorry, I should have noted it down. But a couple of weeks ago, this dancer publicly left Marina Abramovich's performance in the Museum of Modern Art, protesting working conditions in that performance. Um, what she said very, very plainly is that I'm expected to work uninsured for very little money, under risk because she was going to be naked on the table and was turning and people were going to go around, and also sign a non disclosure agreement about the rehearsals that threatened with like a million dollars or whatever, and all this for something like $400. Now, the truth is, there is an artistic it's not just Jeff Jones where the glitz is kind of evident. It's also Marina Abramovich that has been a great artist. Um, there is an artistic belief and there are people, particularly in the performative art, that work for very little in the work on insured. There are things such as how does funding from Europe relate to European policy in particular countries. For example, in Greece, you can't fund culture, and you have to apply for all these programs through Culture 2013 or whatever. But why can't you fund culture? Where did your exports go, for example? Why are you not producing any meat anymore? This has to do something with European agricultural policy. A treaty you signed at some point that says you can't export your land. It sounds very prosaic in our context. You can't export your land to the Middle East because you must do something else. For example, import Belgian beef, so you can't produce.
abuse. I know it's a bit uncomfortable to think about it in relation to art, but does this kind of change in the way we see production in a particular country, does this way not relate to how we can see with European, European funding? Whose beneficiary are art institutions among other things? So I propose that this has to come into the discussion a little bit as well. In the end, this is where I started from. The main thing is making art, culture, whatever, part of it, creating a discourse out there. What does that do? It can't be comfortable, it can't be satisfied that we're having this little talk here. How many of us are there? A hundred people here? We can't be satisfied with that, can we? I mean, they're torturing people. That's it, thank you.